Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining us today at the IFFGD's 2021 Advocacy Event. This evening we are focusing on our military and GI illness. As we all know that there are many overlaps and implications and GI conditions that come with service from our military professionals, both current veterans and um, all those who may even be just non-deployed. Today, we are very lucky to have with us two people who work in research at the Department of Veterans Affairs. First, we have Dr. Karen Block. Dr. Block is a Senior Program Manager of the Gulf War Program at the Office of Research and Development at the Department of Veterans Affairs. Thank you for joining us today, Karen. And also we have with us Dr. Sharma. Dr. Sharma is actually the Scientific Program Manager for Biomedical and Clinical Services in the Department of Veterans Affairs, focusing on, gas on the gastroenterology portfolio. Thank you for being with us today. I think for me, I was a little bit surprised um, several years ago when I learned that there were multiple GI portfolios within the Veterans Affairs. And so I'd like to take a moment at the beginning of this, maybe to talk to you guys a little bit about what is specific to what your research programs are doing for, uh, for veterans um, in GI illness. Dr. Block, can you tell us a little bit about the, um, the Gulf War program? Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much for having us today and uh, putting light on military uh, veterans and their uh, health concerns with GI issues. Um, I run the Gulf, Gulf War program at Office of Research and Development. Our Gulf War uh, veterans fought in the 1990-1991 uh, Gulf War. And uh, they present with a lot of disorders including um, GI disabilities and um, um, IBS. The Gulf War uh, program focuses on uh, particular exposures that the veterans were exposed to while they were in uh, theater, the Southwest Asia Theater of Operation. And when they returned home from the 1990-1991 Gulf War, they um, suffered from many um, illnesses and have many symptoms, including <clears throat> fatigue and uh, headaches and impaired memory, uh, pain, functional gastrointestinal disorders. And we are now trying to understand uh, what is the mechanism by which uh, the exposures may have started uh, causing the uh, symptoms, the multi-symptoms that, um, that they are suffering from. Thank you, Dr. Block. That's, um, you know, that's, it's a good definition of, of how the symptoms might express themselves in, in one of our, our veterans. Dr. Sharma, I understand your portfolio might be a little bit more broad. Um, can you explain a little bit about how that, what that is in, in the Department of Veterans? So at the VA Office of Research and Development, I manage gastroenterology portfolio, which is an uh, over-encompassing GI diseases as well as liver diseases, pancreas, uh, spleen, all the GI organ associated. It's, it's in a different component where we're trying to look at a lot of different areas of understanding the disease progressions, understanding etiology of diseases, developing and coming up with new therapies for it because current therapies are limiting. They are basically maintaining patients' symptoms or taking care of it but not curing it. We're trying to figure out different ways of understanding diseases. So the portfolio what we study is have a various aspects, some of which would be like we study IBDs, IBS, all of those fall in it, but from our perspective is to basic understanding the molecular mechanisms, identifying new therapeutic target, is focused broadly on developing new therapies. That is fantastic. And I know here at IFFGE in our legislative agenda, which is what we're talking about all this week during our advocacy event, one of those high priority items for us is the um, making sure that Congress understands the need for more research funding in all of the areas of research that handle a GI portfolio, which includes the National Institutes of Health, 
the Department of Defense and the Veterans Affairs. Can you both tell me about how much money does our, our country currently invest on research for GI disorders? Dr. Sharma? So at this stage in gastroenterology, which is liver and GI diseases, we fund about $10 million a year on projects of which about half or slightly over half is on GI disease. The remaining is probably from the liver complications, which is equally important for the veterans health. So I would say on an average 5 million or so per year is being spent on funding research on the GI portfolio in the basic science studies and clinical science studies. Fantastic. It's, it's great to know that our government puts a, a priority on GI research. Dr. Black, can you tell us a little bit about the Gulf War Illness uh, Research Portfolio and, and what type of uh, funding that you that we have for research there? Yeah, um, Gulf War Illness is a chronic multi-symptom illness with many different uh, <clears throat> symptoms that arise from the exposures that the Gulf War veterans uh, obtained in the 1990-1991 Gulf War. Um, we know that about 50% of veterans with Gulf War illness um, report with irritable bowel syndrome. And from 2009 to 2021, about 10 years or more, um, we've invested $5.7 million in GI research pertaining to Gulf War or exposure-induced ir irritable bowel syndrome. Um, in our portfolio, um, which would be included under the preclinical model um, and model system, we um, have about 25% of the total that our uh, GI projects make up in that, in that realm. Thank you. That's fantastic. Uh, we really appreciate the dedication of the science to try to help these, um, these Gulf War veterans and, and veterans in general um, have just a better life and, and a better um, outcome for themselves. So let's dig a little bit deeper into each of your portfolios and, and the, the areas of research that you particularly manage in your program. Um, Dr. Block, can you tell us uh, a little bit about what are some of those research efforts? What are some of the, the efforts that are being put forth for the Gulf War illness um, in the portfolio? Of course. Thank you for the question. Um, there's challenges of um, military exposure research. And what I'd like to point out to the, to the audience is that servicemen and service women, when they are deployed, especially in the 1990-1991 Gulf War, um, they were exposed to a multiple of toxicants and agents at unknown quantities. And this includes things such as depleted uranium, the smoke from the oil well fires, the smoke from the burn pits, many airborne hazards, chemical and biological weapons, um, prophylactic drugs that were used against those biological weapons, such as uh, pregnancy and bromide. Um, they had a number of uh, vaccines, and they were exposed to pesticide solvents and fuels. Um, altogether, this makes it very diff difficult for us to understand the etiology of what is causing the uh, barrier in the gut to break down and have the inflammation process started and then um, <clears throat> kind of wreak havoc on, on the body. Um, we don't have a very good way to measure at the individual level the exposure assessment. So we um, have developed Gulf War um, animal models that we can try to understand mechanism and uh, take a deeper dive into understanding uh, what might be causing the issue so that we can target um, precisionally uh, pathways or or molecules that are uh, giving rise to these problems. So, for example, in a Gulf War illness mouse model, we found, or the investigators have found, VA-funded investigators, that, um, that there's differences in the gut microbiome between Gulf War illness veterans and with uh, vet, Gulf War veterans with Gulf War illness versus Gulf War veterans without Gulf War illness. <clears throat> that includes uh, GI disturbances. 
Um, interestingly, um, if you take these animal models and you give them a high fat diet, um, their microbiome is even more disrupted. <clears throat> So this is telling us that it's, it's uh, not only the initial uh, exposure that the veterans had that uh, start by intervening with the, the gut barrier, breaking down that gut barrier, but it also tells us that lifestyle plays a role. And so it's unclear at this time if, you know, um, <clears throat> the lifestyle or maybe the diet is exacerbating or... Um, causing more problems with the um, the intestinal uh, problems that the Gulf War veterans are suffering from. But that's one example. <clears throat> we also have moved into a human model um, where we have several studies that were funded to look at actually the microbiome in the humans. And uh, what we can do by translating this to understanding what is actually going on in the gut of the veterans with and without Gulf War illness is that we can compare it to the animal models and then we can <clears throat> understand differences and similarities so that when we're treating the animal models uh, with some therapeutic target, for example, and you're looking for a reversal of a process or um, stopping of a process, inhibiting that process from going forward, um, you can understand if it can be translated to the clinic. Um, we know that 50% of Gulf War veterans with Gulf War illness report uh, bowel syndrome, irritable bowel syndrome, and studies have looked at the brain-gut axis, meaning we know that, that the gut or the irritable bowel syndrome in the colon is causing a rapid inflammation piece. And uh, the hypothesis here would be that the exposure-induced inflammation causes membrane integrity breakdown or gut leaching. And this results in a systemic inflammation and access to the blood-brain barrier resulting in neuroinflammation and a brain fog and cognitive uh, fatigue. So when the microbiome was uh, yeah, actually evaluated in Gulf War veterans with or without Gulf War illness versus control, the results showed significantly different gut microbiome patterns among the three different groups. Uh, they found that certain bacteria were higher in the veterans with Gulf War illness and that this particular bacteria that they found that was higher was associated with, um, with the gut inflammation and bowel disease. And they also find that this particular bacteria called uh, proteobacteria uh, is, is found in, uh, in uh, Crohn's disease patients and ul ulcerative colitis. On the other hand, um, there, were, uh, there were other bacteria that were found, um, such as Rosberia, and that is reduced in individuals with it, intestinal uh, irritable bowel syndrome. One of its roles uh, for this Roberia is to produce butyrate. And butyrate has been beneficial, um, has beneficial effects for reducing inflammation and maintaining intestinal um, membrane integrity. So uh, this study team went back to a preclinical model of Gulf War illness and <clears throat> primed the animal model with butyrate and found that it improved the inflammation induced by Gulf War illness and intestinal membrane integrity. So this is uh, an example of how we can take a preclinical model and translate that possibly to our human studies. That's fantastic. Dr. Block, it just it's really exciting to me to see um, how far this research is coming. I know that research is slow. I, I used to do clinical research myself back in another life, and but the results can be so rewarding, and to know that you've been able to single out these particular bacteria that might really make a difference in these um, individuals' lives is really, really exciting. Um, so just to ask you one last question, uh, Dr. Block, I understand that there's a lot of talk about sort of the, the COVID long haulers, the people who have COVID and then continue to have GI symptoms following that. And there's been some people that have sort of um, likened it to Gulf War illness. 
and the GI symptoms there, are, are there really any similarities? Has your research shown us any of that at all? Well, in particular, we need to still understand about the long haulers. So COVID long haulers, um, it, it happens in about 30% of COVID-infected individuals get this kind of sustained uh, long hauler phenotype. Um, and they experience long-term health effects that present many symptoms that we actually see in our Gulf War illness veterans, such as brain fog, um, cognitive, uh, cognition uh, impair, chronic fatigue, joint pain, headaches, and irritable bowel syndrome. The difference, uh, COVID also causes lung damage where we do not see respiratory problems in Gulf War veterans with Gulf War illness. But it's, uh, the, the symptoms that we do see in the COVID long haulers are highly suggestive of myologic encephalotomy, uh, encephalomyelitis, chronic fatigue syndrome. And that's usually an infectious induced uh, disease of chronic fatigue and <clears throat> irritable bowel syndrome. So COVID causes an acute but strong inflammatory uh, inflammatory event, what they, which they call the cytokine storm. And Gulf War veterans with Gulf War illness presented um, with higher than basal markers of inflammation. So there's a lot of uh, a lot of similarities that we find in both of these cohorts. It'll be really interesting to see um, what brain imaging looks like and, um, you know, the white and gray matter uh, volume that we see in our exposed uh, Gulf War veterans. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Dr. Block. Um, really interesting work being done at the Department of Veterans Affairs in the area of Gulf War illness. Um, so, Dr. Sharma, let's talk about your program a little bit. It's very big, has a lot of of areas of the GI to cover, as you mentioned earlier, um, and, and I know there's a lot going on, but can you maybe tell us a little bit about some of the current research studies that are being held um, inside your research program and being funded by your department? So one of the focus has been on trying to figure out new targets, new therapeutic approaches to treat IBGs, inflammation, wound healing, because currently the steroid therapies or uh, biologics have a lot of other as, as immune suppressive complications, and some of them do not work or individuals become refractory to those. So we're trying to understand, can we identify new targets? Can we identify new mechanisms which would allow us to treat it? And like research from taking from basic to clinic, not everything would work out. So the idea is to figure out different approaches, different targets, People are working on how the wound healing could be regulated to prevent the remission from disease to occur. So maintain the remission going on. If you can prevent the, uh, accelerate the wound healing, it will prevent the remission of IBD. Or figuring it out how to prevent acidity or inflammation, or figuring out ways to regulate the membrane permeability. So those are the things. and. We have programs to support moving those ideas towards the translation into clinics. So we're trying to encourage investigators not only to identify new targets and new mechanism, but think of ways to moving it forward. So that is one area we're looking at. Like other areas of portfolio is we have acid reflux and associated cancer of a GI tract, which is being studied. Currently, they get. Uh, mechanism to prevent acid production, but if precancerous cells would still continue to go ahead and develop a cancer. So we're trying to understand how to take care of that, how to prevent them from developing. The similarly, we have helicobacter pylori and GI infection, which is bigger cancer. And again, these are significantly higher prevalence in veterans than the general population because of their travels abroad, duty, a lot of other things. So we're trying to, again, understand in that mechanism how helicobacter pylori triggers the cancer, what happens, what we can do, what are the potential pathways to do that. So we're looking at that. We also have a focus on understanding gut microbiomes studies because, as Dr. Block mentioned, there isn't a connection between GI, gut, brain, liver axis, and gut microbiomes play a significant role in modulating and manipulating this thing. 
One of the interesting thing is that we have investigator working on C. diff infection, which is in a major hospital associated and really important. And we're trying to figure out different ways of taking care of C. diff infections by the, either using a endogenous antibiotics being developed in the uh, with use of a bacteria and bile acid uh, to develop it or come up with different ways of probiotic approaches to take care of C. diff infections. So we're looking at that. We're trying to do various different mechanisms, like we have investigators who have looked at giving the modulating gut microbiome would give an indication that it can reduce alcohol consumption and uh, alcohol dependency. So like there are gut brain access, which is going on, impacting inflammation, impacting liver function. So we are looking at that as in a biomarker for several uh, gut brain diseases. You know, or, or, as well as coming up with new therapeutic approaches to try to use these to prevent or improve the conditions veterans are suffering right now. So the portfolio is varied with a different focus. We're trying to look at how to move these discoveries into clinic, do clinical relevant, uh, clinical practice, things like that. So that's where major effort is currently in the GI portfolio. That, that is a lot. So that there's so many different projects that you just mentioned, and, and they're all very exciting and very important right now, especially, you know, in the GI population as a whole. But as you mentioned, you know, some of these things are just, just have a higher prevalence or, or more um, or often seen in, in, in the veteran population. And so the fact that the Department of Veterans Affairs is investing in this type of research is very exciting, um, it's very exciting for me, especially coming from a military family as I did with several veterans in, in my family. So, uh, but just to sort of boil it down, what what is your long-term goal? When you're looking at your portfolio and the research that you're doing, what is the long-term goal and how might that impact the care of veterans in the future? So there, there are a few things which we are trying to do. We're trying to bring multidisciplinary investigators together. So I think in the early 2019, we had a field-based meeting where we involved VA and non-VA investigator to understand role of gut microbiome in service-connected GI diseases, which include IBD, IBS. And that panel came up with recommendations about how they can study and develop treatments for uh, diarrheal diseases associated with inflammation and IBS. Uh, that component also how this component GI, uh, you know, gut microbiomes can be impacting liver function and liver associated brain impact, looking at new ways of regulating IBDs in gut microbiome. So that's one area where we're trying to see how we can do it. And as Dr. Block mentioned, there are areas where we can look at nutritional supplementation to at least help veterans to manage their conditions or at least delay recurrence and things like that. So that's one area we're looking at. A lot of focus is also in identifying where the current treatments, what are the limitations of the current treatments and how we can overcome that. So like, for example, as I mentioned before, we have current treatment, which are maintenance therapies. They do not cure diseases and they are not effective in all the individuals who take those treatments. So we're trying to figure it out. Can we understand basic principle or mechanism by which these diseases occur? Can we develop a treat to control that? And our aim is to try to encourage them, provide them support of taking those ideas and moving towards uh, doing drug development studies, doing some clinical studies, moving those projects forward. So we have several interesting proposals where investigators have moved novel therapies towards moving towards the getting FDA approval. So it's a long process where we're moving from basic research, doing proof of concept studies, supporting the validation and different cohorts to identify that, okay, what you see in one works in the other. So it's generalized, it's not an experimental concern. So things like that. So basic idea is to identify the limitations of current therapies and treatments and develop and bring them to the market as fast as we can. So that's where we're trying to focus our effort on. 
That is fantastic. Thank you so much, Dr. Sharma. And for those of you who are watching, there's a couple of takeaways that I hope that you are able to glean from our program today. One is that the Department of Veterans Affairs is doing a lot of research and, and we applaud them for what they've done. I feel like there's been a lot of great studies, a lot of great strides, and I encourage you when you contact your Congress members this week to let them know what a great job the Department of Veterans Affairs Research Programs are doing, how much you appreciate what they are doing for us and for our veterans and military personnel, and that we hope that they will continue to support um, budget increases for the Department of Veterans Affairs so that they can continue and make these goals a reality in the future. Also, secondly, there is a lot of research going on at the Department of Veterans Affairs and research, especially clinical studies, can only happen if there are people willing to take part in these studies. And as IFFGD has often said before, if we want to see that needle moved forward, we have to be a part of the research. And no, that doesn't mean that you join a hospital lab and, and you learn how to crunch numbers or, or do studies as a clinical research coordinator, you can actually just be willing to be screened to see if you are a candidate to participate in one of these very important clinical trials that these researchers are doing. And if you are interested in doing that, please, please look at the resources that will be available at the end of this program. Not only will there be a slide at the end of this video with some links for you, we will also include them on the webpage where this video will be housed and it will be in the chat boxes. They should, you should see them coming up now during this Vimeo program so that you can click on these links and you can learn a little bit more about uh, VA funded research. There uh, will be in, there'll be information about the VA office research and de development funded projects. There will also be information on current and past clinical trials. If you're interested in knowing what's been done, and what's going on, you can just read about them and see. There'll be a link for that. There's also information on current and previously funded research projects. This is the, the link that's the project reporter at NIH.gov, and that will help you to understand a little bit more about what research has been funded. And then f finally, you will find in the PubMed link, which um, will have the published results of research studies. Now, some of those are journal articles written for clinicians. And if you have any questions at all about anything that you've learned today, anything that you've read on any of those links, please contact us at advocacy at IFFGD.org. That's advocacy at IFFGD.org. And we will do our best to help navigate you to where you need to go to answer questions or put you in contact with the right people. And of course, you can always go to the Department of Veterans Affairs current research uh, webpage, which is also should be showing up in your Vimeo link about right now, um, that will give you a good overview of everything that they're doing at the Department of Veterans Affairs. Today, we are so, so excited to have with us two uh, of the leadership personnel at the Department of the VA, uh, Dr. Uh, Sharma, who is the Scientific Program Manager for Biomedical and Clinical Ser Services in the Department of Veterans Affairs, focusing on the gastroenterology portfolio, and also Dr. Karen Block, who is the Senior Program Manager for the Gulf War Program at the Office of Research and Development at the Department of Veterans Affairs. Thank you both for joining with us today and helping us to get a, a little glimpse of what the VA is doing for our veterans and military personnel and a little glimpse at the future of what we might expect and hope for, because hope is always important for us as we look to the future. Thank you so much for your time today. And for those of you at home, please continue watching our program. And remember that if you have any questions at all, you can always contact us at advocacy at IFFGD.org. Thank you. Thank you.